this group that we've assembled, these, these terrific uh, leaders in writing assessment have come together er, to Hello, this is Darren Cambridge, Director of Policy Research and Development with the National Council of Teachers of English. And I'm glad to welcome you to this conversation about what the work of the National Day on Writing can teach us about assessment. Uh, my, I show up on your screen as the leadership, but the real leadership is the panel of all-star NCT members we have assembled today. Um, and I will let them uh, introduce themselves in a moment. And, uh, but they are uh, teachers, educators, there's at the, the uh, elementary through who, uh, college level, well, all experts on writing assessment. Uh, and they're going to uh, talk about what the, the many pieces of writing that were shared during the National Day on Writing, which was on Monday, October 20th, this can uh, say to us about how we assess writing. And this will be an opportunity for you uh, as an audience member, either, e either if you're joining us live or you're listening to this as a recording, in, to see how uh, experienced educators make sense of a diverse collection of writing and the thought processes they go through who, uh, in trying to figure out what does a piece of writing signify and what does it tell us about literacy development, what does it tell us about how we ought to be uh, doing our job as literacy educators. Um, so, so Catherine Pierce is going to be um, our, uh, is going to lead us off and uh, she, she is our lead moderator for this panel. So I'll turn it over to Catherine to introduce herself and to invite the other members of the panel to introduce themselves and I'll be here in the background on uh, trying to keep things, things running smoothly. But uh, let's hear from the educators. Thank you, Darren, and thank you also NCTE staff for helping us get this session up and running and the images that you were about to see on our slides here. Uh, my name, as Darren said, is Catherine Mitchell Pierce. I teach a sixth grade literacy program in the St. Louis area in a middle school, and I've also taught at the elementary and university levels. And um, just browsing through the samples that we've seen so far from the day of writing, I'm really excited about the information that we have and the possibilities of working with this information over the several months ahead now, um, using these to inspire some of our ongoing conversations about assessment of writing and also sharing strategies for the ways that we invite students to get engaged in shaping the kinds of writing they do in their classrooms. So other panelists, you want to jump in and introduce yourselves and give us a little hint about your background. Elizabeth, why don't you go first? Okay, my name is Elizabeth Yeager. I'm an assistant professor um, in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies at the University of Arizona. Um, I teach courses here. Um, in teacher education at both the undergraduate and master's level. And I also teach a course in influential readings um, for our doctoral students. My research interests have two main prongs. Um, one is supporting vulnerable readers, those children who are most vulnerable to disruptions in their literacy ecologies. And the second is in the area of elementary writing. Um, in which I investigate uh, the functions that young children employ uh, for their writing and also the co-composing process when more than one child um, collaborates on a single piece. Thank you. And um, Lisa, would you like to go next and introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is Lisa Sheriff, and I am an English and reading teacher at Estero High School, which is near Fort Myers, Florida. Um, this is my second year back in the high school classroom after 11 years as an English educator. My interest with writing um, has always been around. Um, I didn't necessarily enjoy writing growing up, so now I try to make it a better experience for my students. And as we're moving towards new writing assessments in the state, that's something that my colleagues and I are are really struggling with. So I'm always very interested in how we can become better teachers of writing, 
make our kids enjoy writing and hopefully have them become better writers as well and take that with them out of school into the rest of their lives. Thanks. And Scott, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm uh, Scott Silkins. I teach uh, a variety of literacy support classes at Central High School in Champaign, Illinois. Um, so most of my work now is centered around um, reading, but um, my uh, passion in adolescent literacy has always been about writing. I co-direct our writing project site at the University of Illinois uh, and find ways to have kids write as often as they can, even in a class that they think is called reading. Thank you. So audience, as you can see, I am joined by a number of people that have just a fabulous collection of experiences and interests and research projects related to writing. And so this is a great opportunity for us to talk with you and um, share some of our perspectives on the collection of writing that we've gathered through the Day of Writing. I thought we'd start and spend just a very few minutes just sharing, sharing some general observations of the pile of writing that came in. Um, so I'll start it off and then panelists feel free to jump in at any time. Um, one of the things that I noticed was that there was a wide variety of school and class events where teachers or entire schools or university classes um, arranged to have entire events organized for students so that they could have a collaborative and shared writing experience, which I think adds a lot, particularly to the topic of writing our community. Um, I love the post-it collections. There were interesting prompts that people responded to via post-its, and then the post-its were displayed on walls and on smart boards and on windows. And um, I thought, what a wonderful way to capture writing and then be able to move it around and play with it. Um, we also noticed some samples from younger children working with chalk on sidewalks. And again, a wonderful way to capture writing and get it out in the community's eyes to remind everyone that all of us are writers, even our very youngest um, students, and even before they're formally students, all of us are at some level writing in some way. Um, there were some fabulous um, uh, projects. One was a sensory description of food that was in a, li in a cafeteria. Um, and I know that in sixth grade, we spend a lot of time working on teaching uh, descriptive language and sensory details. And I thought having that can in the middle of the cafeteria for kids to drop in their descriptions would be entertaining, especially if there were some particularly gross foods one or two days on the menu to get some fun things. Anyone else want to jump in and share some of their observations of just the general collection that we had and the things that jumped out at you in your first browsing through? Yeah, this is Scott. Um, one, one thing that I noticed, um, and this is true anytime you give anyone any sort of prompt, and this kind of brings the, the conversation a little bit toward assessment, is that um, people take prompts up in different ways. So if we know that uh, the theme, the hashtag for this National Day on Writing was Write My Community, I really liked how people took that uh, notion or that prompt up in really different ways. Um, like there are some people who took photos of their uh, community and posted those as a writing of their community. Um, other people wrote text explaining what their community uh, was and why they thought it was important to them. Um, but then probably my favorites are the ones where groups of people got together and made the fact that they were in a room together or in a digital space together writing uh, their way of being a community. So um, just like we never know what kids are going to do when we prompt them, um, even if we um, want them to go a certain way, uh, they're likely to go in a whole bunch of different ways. And that's one of the things I liked about uh, the collection that I had a chance to look at. Thanks. Scott for sharing that. I, as I looked through, I made a list of some strategies and teaching ideas I wanted to take back to my own classroom. I love the six second recorded narratives, which is a nice uh, variation on the six word memoir. Um, I also wanted to steal and use the playlist poetry. I hadn't seen that before. And I thought, oh, what an awesome idea to inspire kids to look at poetry using some of the language that they're surrounded with all the time. Um, I, the chalk talk idea where there's a prompt on a board and people communicate silently by just recording things, um, as Scott said, in the company of others, but just recording and responding to one another in writing all over either a chalkboard or a giant roll of butcher paper. We call that chalk talk at our school. 
Um, I also noticed the kids taking selfies of themselves as writers. We do have our kids do identity photos where they pose and create their own photos. And I thought, what fun to be able to do selfies that show them as readers, show them as writers, show them as active members of their community. So again, I'm collecting lots of ideas to take back to my own classroom. Before we move on and talk about the specific writing samples themselves, is there anyone else who wanted to jump in and make any comments about the general collection of writing samples that people saw? This is Lisa. I, I just really liked that um, some of the teachers encouraged all their classes to write, and then they added it and uploaded it to their own personal blogs. I thought that was a fantastic idea in bringing in, you know, away from traditional writing as well. I found that striking as well, the uh, ways in which the different smaller pieces of writing, uh, some of which were you know, quite a small grain size, uh, being that they were shared through social media, that, that would make a lot of sense, were really put into conversation with each other, were collected uh, in terms of a classroom or a school in interesting ways so that you could see uh, trace paths through them and, and really begin to see a conversation about what is our community that's being written collaboratively through multiple small pieces of writing. Thank you. I'm going to move now to looking at the actual writing samples. And we're going to start with this one right here that came from a group of seventh grade writers in Iowa. And it, it caught my attention for a number of reasons. First of all, that it's set in the Midwest where I live and grew up, and also that it's a poem. And frequently, it, as a teacher, I know I find it very challenging to figure out what is my role in the assessment of a student's piece of poetry. Um, it doesn't follow some of the same rules that, for example, a narrative might follow. And so I've always found that I have to think outside my training to find ways of uh, supporting the student, providing warm and receptive feedback, but also challenging the student to take this to another step. A couple of things that I noticed as I went through there um, was the repetition of the phrase farm community and farming community. I'm going to try my hand here at the pointer and see how I do with that. All right, so I'm looking right here at farmer community and farming community. And I thought that repetition was fun and was going to perhaps invite the writer, if this writer was working with me, to play around with um, looking for other examples and opportunities for that. There's more farming and family community here. And I saw that notion of community coming up again and again. Another piece that caught my attention was right here, these 9820 track tractors. I grew up in a farm community, and I have no idea what that is. And um, I'm sure my brother would laugh, but I can't tell you what that is. But um, I thought that was fun, and it would invite some further conversation and put the students in a position of being the expert, teaching me a little bit about what was represented in the information that's here in the poem. I also love this phrase right here, brothers catching on the go in the fields. And thinking about how hard that is to communicate when everybody is out working in the fields all day long. And the writer comes back to that later on about this section right here, not seeing your dad all day. And I thought the writer did a fabulous job of showing a particular perspective on what it's like to be part of a farm family during harvest time. I thought this entire poem was such a nice contrast to some others that we saw um, that were odes to San Antonio. And it made me think about the role of writing to connect writers to the place where they live, that Wendell Berry sense of a sense of place. And that having a collection like this from the day of writing, where we have writing that's so grounded in Iowa and writing that's so grounded in San Antonio. And then for my kids in St. Louis to say, that's not my community. So then what would our community look like? And how would it be expressed through writing? And how could we use various types of writing to help others get a sense of who we are and where we live and what it's like to be here? I also wanted to share, um, OK, maybe not. I'm going to go backwards. 
So um, in a few minutes, we'll figure out how to put up here for you a sample of two strategies for looking closely at student writing. One of them is um, a writing form that we use with teachers in our school. It's called Plus Minus Delta. And we adapted it from Carol Gillis at University of Missouri Columbia who came and shared it with our teachers. And it's helpful for me because it reminds us to look not only at the things that we see a student is falling short on, but to identify the things that we're really celebrating. And so using that form, we begin with the celebrations and then move to the things that we're curious about or concerned about. And then from there, move to moving some, making some plans for how we want to help that writer grow in particular directions. And that, that direction is grounded in the assessment that we've made with the writer of the things that are going well and the things that the writer wants to work on. The last thing um, that I wanted to share eventually when we figure out how to get it up here is um, a sample of a protocol for professional conversations about student writing. And I think several of us are going to talk about that. Oh, fun, somebody's playing with it. Um, that we'll have a chance to talk about how teachers can come together to have generative conversations about writing. And so we'll come back to that when we get closer to the end of our session today and do some wrap up. So right now I'm going to invite Elizabeth to join us and talk a little bit about the writing perspective that she took on the samples that are here and the lenses that she used to begin anal analyzing some of what's here. So Elizabeth, take it away. So the samples that I looked at were the ones associated with some elementary students, um, specifically a classroom of first through third grade multi-age um, who partnered with another multi-age class of fourth and fifth graders. And what I'm going to focus here on here more so than was the case in the previous sample is the process that these writers took to generate their writing. Um, there is less evidence in what was posted about the content itself, so that's the reason I'm choosing to focus on process. Um, the, the two classrooms began by writing their own individual poems. And they took those poems and sliced them into six lines, six sections, I suppose, um, and brought those sections uh, in a baggie uh, to meet with their partner in the opposite class. And they didn't begin by writing right away. They began with some extended play time for them to get to know each other. After that, they took um, some of the sections of their individual poems and combined them with the uh, individual sections of their partner's poems, figuring out the order they wanted them to be in, combining them, and adding additional lines that they wrote in collaboration. When they felt that their drafts were finished, they took chalk, um, as Catherine mentioned earlier, and wrote and draw, drew their poems on the sidewalk um, for passers-by to see. So there are a few themes that I'd like to mention relative to this writing project, and then some ways that we might think about assessment. So the first theme in my mind is the theme of co-authorship not simply sitting together over a piece of paper and writing with pencils, but beginning with a playtime where the co-authors get to know each other to understand each other better uh, before engaging in the more formal um, aspects of co-authorship. The second theme I see going on with this work is the theme of multimodality. So we have writing with pencil or pen on paper that's cut up and moved around, but we also see the ultimate display using chalk uh, on a sidewalk. And the third theme I'd like to talk about has to do with audience. Um, the audience for these poems were most certainly themselves, uh, personally, um, their partners, but the audience extended out into the community and 
viewed the community itself as the primary audience uh, for those creations. So I think in talking about assessment, we can address each of these themes. Um, the co-authorship process uh, ended up producing what we might call a double-voiced piece in that it included the voices of both of the authors. Um, adding lines, revising lines helped to unify that piece. So in looking at a final draft, what we might ask ourselves is, are, the, are each of the individual voices still heard loudly and clearly? And then on the opposite side, how well are they unified uh, to form a more coherent uh, whole? Multimodality, how did the children use the chalk on the sidewalk? What did the print look like? What colors were used? Were there drawings to accompany what they were writing? And then finally, the question of audience. Did these poems actually catch the imagination of passers-by? And we've come to learn um, by reading the teachers' comments that people driving by stopped in their cars to comment on what the children had done. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now, if Lisa, would you like to jump in and share with us the writing um, samples and lenses that you selected for today? Sure, Catherine. Thanks. I actually picked, and what really struck out to me was the writing by a teacher from Iowa, a middle school teacher. And, you know, having come back to the classroom, um, we're in the midst of this, and it just, it really resonated with me. And, and you know, I know we're, we're thinking sometimes assessment of students writing. I think with this one, um, assessment is one of the external influences that affects her reflection here. Um, you know, she talks about sort of this positive-negative continuum in terms of her feelings and emotions when she's with other colleagues and, you know, the negativity surrounding the schools. Um, there's sort of, I sort of saw a theme of this internal and external and that she's got this safety net to write in and the safety net of colleagues that are supportive and, and teaching and talking and sharing together. And teachers as community. So a community within a community within a community, so to speak. And, and that really um, struck me. And the other thing that, I, that really struck me is more questions, is how many classroom teachers feel safe to write and express their feelings like this in such a public forum? And how supported are they in doing this? I know there's a lot of educators out there with blogs and they tweet, but it really got me thinking, um, even with my own blog that I let go, I seem to not find time to write on that blog. Um, and sometimes that gets rid of the isolation. And I get a sense from reading here, you know, she says she's renewed and falls in love with content and the people who teach it. And so her teaching community becomes very important. And it just brings back to mind the fact that, you know, we're, we talk a lot about what our students are doing and how our students are writing. And how can we find ways as educators to write during the year um, in not the traditional format that we're supposed to write in, which could be articles or books or research reports or grants or lesson plans, and how beautiful it would be if, if we could write with chalk on the sidewalk as well. And, and I think that's why this piece really struck me rather than a student piece. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for reminding us that teachers are writers also, that we're not only writers in our professional work every day, but we're also writers about our own experiences. And I um, think some of the work that I most enjoy reading is work that's written by teachers about their work in classrooms and about their own reflections on the communities in which their students live. And I'm hoping that this day of writing will continue to include teachers feeling confident writing about their own experiences. Scott, you want to show us what you picked up out of the blog that you selected? Absolutely. Um, 
it's great that some of the things I'm going to talk about are um, common threads from some uh, of the previous comments, but um, this author, whose name I wish I really knew how to pronounce, um, I think it's maybe Briacy, um, but I'll call her the author so I don't continue to mispronounce her name, um, some of the cool stuff she's doing. Um, so the author has um, interviewed two family members um, and written a, a blog that unites their two responses uh, in terms of their own personal response, uh, personal experiences with um, racism. So um, one of the things that attracted me to this piece right away is the, um, the, the bravery with which the student approached this topic, but also the measured way in which she presented it. So thinking back to the uh, notion of audience and approach um, that Elizabeth mentioned, um, this topic has the potential to uh, get very complicated and sometimes really negative really fast. Um, and this piece certainly um, addresses things in a complicated way, but in a way that I think invites conversation rather than um, shutting it down. Um, she also um, is involved in a really interesting collaborative co-authorship in the sense that she's pro provided a little bit of framing text, but primarily what she's done is um, presented the stories that her family members have uh, shared with her. In the first case, it reads almost like an interview transcript. Um, now, uh, so the, the second case, uh, where the author did more of the crafting of the narrative herself. Um, so one thing that I wondered about is to what extent um, has she crafted both of these stories and to what extent is she being more of a documentarian? Um, either way, I think the writing is really um, cool, but from an assessment standpoint, I'm interested in how much she uh, crafted their stories uh, and how much she's represented them pretty much as, as they were told to her. So um, already I'm, I'm seeing a couple of uh, important questions for us to think about in terms of assessment. Um, what do we do when students collaborate and co-author? How do we assess contribution? And Elizabeth brought up a couple of um, really cool points already, but um, in, a, in a context that's focused so much on accountability and individual authorship, I wonder how do we make the space for this kind of writing and how do we um, assess it in a way that truly acknowledges the contribution that um, all the authors brought to the piece. Uh, but the part that truthfully attracted me to this is the comments. Um, I'm really uh, fascinated with the idea of uh, writing as participation. Um, I study with Ann Dyson at um, the University of Illinois and her work is all about how little kids write their way into each other's lives. Um, and as a high school teacher who uh, was trained maybe a little bit more uh, traditionally, I thought of writing as the production of text for a certain um, academic purpose. So it's been really eye-opening for me to think about the way that writing gives us ways to um, not just communicate, um, even a step further, participate purposely in an ongoing conversation and thinking about how writing um, is a, a really rich social practice. So she had a lot of responses, um, but the one I want to focus on is uh, the, the conversation between Chelsea and the author, where Chelsea uh, first thanks her for the post uh, and acknowledges her emotional response to um, what she um, read about. Um, then she praised her for um, her uh, bravery and strength in bringing these issues into the conversation and encourages her to keep writing, to which the author says thank you, um, and my favorite part is she says, I think that it will definitely make me a better, uh, make my writing better by um, feeling the support of, of people like her. So when we think about assessment and formative assessment, um, seeing the student see that, say that what is going to make her a better writer is the encouragement to keep going and to participate in an ongoing conversation to me was huge. Um, because if you look back at the text, the, some of the surface features um, have errors, but uh, as I read the piece, I didn't notice them. Um, and I'm, I'm suspecting that the uh, people who commented to her overlooked them as well as I think they should have. Um, but but the, the author is pointing out that the feedback, the rich feedback from um, peers or other online readers is the thing that's going to make her a better writer, which uh, warmed my heart. I love that. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, panelists, for sharing with us such a wide variety of writing samples and helping us 
consider various lenses on these pieces of writing. And again, our conversation today is meant to be a starting place of looking at assessment of writing and looking at the materials from the day of writing over a long term. Um, I thought at this point we could throw out some particular assessment questions that are raised by our conversation here today and perhaps have a short conversation about that. One of the questions that um, I've been increasingly curious about is how we define the health of a literacy community. It's one we've talked about in uh, various leadership groups within NCTE. And so I think one assessment question we might ask of the larger sample and the smaller set that we selected is what are students writing? What forms are they choosing for this writing? And what types of writing were not represented here that we might expect or usually find in a typical classroom or in the larger society's use of writing as a whole? And in what ways are students using digital and multimodal writing? Several of our panelists addressed that today. In what ways are they doing that? And then what are the implications for our responsibility to include opportunities to both experience and create digital multimodal writing experiences in school. Um, several of us mentioned today the per, a powerful personal connection that writers had to the choice that they made about what they would write. But these pieces, for the most part, were very personal. And putting them out there for the World Wide Web to explore and respond to, I think, is a brave act, as was mentioned earlier. I think it also allows us to assess the way writers use writing to understand themselves and to put themselves out there for the larger world. Um, the prompt was looking at writing our community. And so I think we could take a broad brush look at how writers use writing to connect with their community, to reflect it, and also to try and influence it. Um, several of the people who posted even short tweets and other short post-it pieces were making critical comments about their community. And I think we could assess how comfortable students are and how effective our classrooms are in creating space for this use of writing as social critique. At this point, I'm going to invite our other panelists to jump in and add some of the, their own questions or assessment ideas that are coming to their mind as they think about the collection of writing that we've just begun to look at and some of the topics that we've shared with one another here. Anybody like to go next? Lisa, go ahead. I wrote my question on the, the chat area, but one of my questions slash fears is you know, with the new standardized writing assessments that are coming for kids, they're going to be forced to do those on a computer now. So in, in essence, they're, compose, they're pre writing, composing, publishing via computer. And I just wonder what that's going to do to their own feelings about the independent writing or the writing they do for fun via technology. I agree. I think that it's, um, as I look around at the way computers are used in our building, and we're very fortunate to have what I call a highly resourced school district, we have access to a pretty significant number of computers in the building. And yet, when I count the number of weeks that the computer labs are closed to classroom work because they're being used for computer-based assessments, um, I get a little nervous about the impact of testing on curriculum and also this heavy emphasis on the use of computers as a way to show what you know um, and the stark contrast between the use of a computer for um, a fill in the blank, multiple choice, even a comp even short constructed response versus the uses of digital technology that we saw represented in some of the samples um, that were included in the day of writing. I think we have a long way to go to um, figure out what are the best and most supportive uses of technology, not only in generating writing, but also in assessing it. Anyone else like to comment at this point? 
I would um, connect to that concern the increased importance of teaching kids to self-assess their writing. Um, there's a part of me that feels like computer-based assessment is going to go the way it's going to go. And that even if that is the case, if we focus on helping kids to understand for themselves what is strong and less strong in their work, um, so that whatever formal assessments they are given, they can maintain their self-respect and their self-image as a strong writer in the face of whatever other assessments may tell them. In the chat, uh, Barbara Cambridge asks, how does assessment differ when you're looking at multiple samples at once as opposed to a single sample? Is your reaction to the sample different if the sample is in the context of other samples? And I think we're used to thinking about this question in the context of uh, portfolio assessment, which um, many of us who teach writing in uh, practice with our students, looking at a collection of uh, single students' work uh, across multiple genres and across time. But, but what does it mean if we're looking at a collection of multiple students' work? Does that change the way we view individual pieces? Um, Catherine here, and I'm wondering if we've figured out a way to put um, the Atlas protocol up that I sent very late this afternoon. Um, because I think it begins to do what Darren was just asking. It's a protocol that was actually grew out of, um, oh, okay, yay. All right. Um, I'm not sure. Somehow I think I got a message saying that the protocol had been sent, but I don't know how to get it up so people can see it. But anyway, the Atlas Protocol um, invites a group of teachers to look at a collection of writing and to go through a process of really looking and answering the first question, what do you see, which is just a very literal description of the specific details and um, examples of the writing to so actually describe what they're looking at in order to help keep the focus on the actual writing and not help, help us to avoid jumping too quickly to assessment judgments of the writing. And then after looking at what was there, trying to avoid judgment, is to begin to interpret what do we think is going on in the writing samples as a collection. And for example, things like from the student's perspective, what was the student working on? or to ask questions about what we think the students were doing and why they were doing this. And I think when we look at some of the samples from the day of writing, we can guess what the directions were from the teacher or the adult that was organizing the event, but we may not be able to um, know exactly what was going on. But I think it's helpful to have those conversations about, there we go, thank you, about what we think is going on in the writing. And then after there's lots of sort of shared appreciation of what are we all looking at, then I think we can begin to have some of those conversations about what do we value and what we see, what concerns us because it is or isn't represented in the sample, and what are some of the implications for this, not just for the teacher of the children whose work is represented, but for all of us who are participating in the conversation, what can we take away from this shared conversation about student writing that will inform the ways we teach writing and the ways we assess writing in our own classroom. Um, so this grows out of uh, critical friends group work, if you're familiar with that. And it's also grounded in some of the work from um, uh, Project Zero at Harvard. And oh, I see the next slide is up. Yay, thank you. Um, the next slide, which is the plus minus delta I referenced earlier. And again, this can be used with a class set of writings or a collection of writing samples, such as the ones that we saw in the day of writing, or it can be used to look at a single student's writing. Um, this is adapted from Carol Gillis, University of Missouri 
Columbia, she um, shared this with our building as part of some writing work that we did. And it really helped our teachers remember to focus on the celebrations of what these writers are already doing and not move quickly to identifying the places where they fall short of a standard. And one reason I value that is because I think it reminds us that we're working on the writer and not the writing. And if we look to see what is the writer accomplishing and doing well and almost ready to do independently or more proficiently, then I think our assessment can be geared more toward the, the path of development that the writer is demonstrating rather than the predetermined one that a set of standards or assessment guidelines have determined for us. So thank you again, Debbie, for getting both of those images up so people can take a look. Scott, can you talk a little bit about how this fits into the work that you've done with formative assessment and how we might look at this collection of writing for ideas about what are some next steps for these writers and how do we as teachers plan to support writers who are generating this type of work already? Yeah, I think to connect to um, Barbara's question, anytime you have multiple pieces of writing, whether it's by the same student or a group of students, um, it helps you. When I think of the most important part of assessment is um, being able to look for the things that really stand out in the piece. Uh, and when you look at pieces side by side or multiple pieces, um, I think they're each, their individual um, strengths stand out more. Um, so you can see what's strong about each piece, but you can also see patterns uh, of strength across a group. So um, kind of connecting both questions, looking at multiple pieces certainly helps you um, see strengths that maybe you wouldn't have noticed before. It also helps you notice uh, patterns. And to your point, Catherine, about um, students' developmental paths as writers, um, the more evidence you have as to where kids are, the more hints you have as to where they're asking you to, to take them. Um, and if you're in a classroom climate or a, any sort of context where there's a lot of talk about writing, which I hope there is, um, you can certainly elicit from students what they think the next step should be. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think about in terms of uh, the most important uh, aspects of formative assessment to, to bring to writing. Um, making sure that all of this talk that we're having about uh, writing is part of the classroom conversation as well. I wonder if uh, collections like this that, that really are trying to represent community writing and to enact community through the activity of writing, um, if they can tell us something not just about uh, individual students uh, writing in uh, de development as writers, writing skills, but also something about the literacy environment of the larger community, the, the capacity of the community to support the development of studer students as writers. As I was listening, I was really struck by the idea that in, in the community where students wrote uh, in chalk on the sidewalk, their collaborative poems that people pulled over and and got out of their cars and talked to the students and looked at them, and, and that for me is a sign of a really healthy community environment where uh, literate activity is valued, um, and that. Uh, I think there's something really important about not just assessing students uh, as individuals or collaboratively, but assessing the environments that support the development of students. So that, that's, to me, seemed like one real opportunity with this sort of collection, which is not the typical kind of collection we would see in an academic context uh, for assessment. This is Elizabeth, um, connected to what you were just saying. Um, here in Tucson, we have a couple uh, areas within the city limits that refer to themselves as literacy zones. And they are communities that have come together to take leadership um, in hoping that their community members are well served as literate people. 
Um, and, and they've done this in, a, in a, a relatively formalized way, assessing what literacy looks like in their communities and how it can be further strengthened. I think, uh, I think writing would be a very strong piece of that assessment. Thank you, Elizabeth and Darren and Scott for adding those additional comments to our discussion about looking at the larger sample of writing. Um, I'd like to throw another question out to the group. Um, one of the best university courses I took, the instructor found a magical way of having our midterm and final assessment experience be something that was actually a growth experience, that by participating in the assessment, I ended up learning more than I knew when I came through. And I'm wondering how we might create assessment opportunities for these students that are similar, where the assessment actually helps to inform their writing, and in some way, the assessment event contributes to their growth as writing, rather than just um, measuring them against some kind of a benchmark. Um, if I convince anybody to chime in on that topic. Um, this is Scott. The first thing that comes to mind when, when I hear you talking about assessment as opportunities for kids to grow, um, take the idea that I was mentioning with uh, my sample piece about writing as participation and brings it back into the, the classroom in terms of um, any sort of writing assessment I feel like needs to be part of the ongoing conversation of the class. So um, things like uh, cold prompts or um, prompts that are kind of dropped out of, out of nowhere um, I think are the antithesis to what you're talking about, Catherine, um, but making sure that assessments are really deeply embedded in uh, what students have been talking about and already discussing with peers gives them a chance to think of the assessment opportunity as um, another way that they're participating in the ongoing conversation. Um, I know I, I had a university class, Catherine, that the, the, the exams were just like that and I thought, wow, I, I, want, um, I want my assessments to, to work like this as well. And um, they also tended to be collaborative. Um, we worked in small groups uh, in that class on those assessments. Um, so they were literal conversations that became a product. So I think the, the deeply embedded nature of assessment in ongoing uh, classroom work um, is, is one way to get at what you're talking about. Anyone else want to weigh in on that topic? All right, a second um, qu question for the group. Um, we've talked a lot about the role of community in this prompt in particular because it was central to the invitation on the day of writing. And I'm thinking back to the standards that NCTE and IRA created several years ago on the assessment of English language arts. And one of the strong components in that document was the importance of having community involvement in the assessment of student work. And as we look at this collection of writing samples, I'm beginning to wonder what would um, parents, um, community leaders, and um, future potential employers think when they see this collection of writing? And in what way would they judge the writing? Um, what would they learn about the kids in our schools on the basis of what they see reflected here? And what would they see as evidence that their community is a thriving literate community? Um, so I'm going to throw us back to the group and see if anybody wants to pick up on that in terms of how we might invite parents and community members to be active and um, constructive participants in the assessment process. So I am asking some awesome questions because I'm getting zero responses to some of them. So, so Catherine, I think, I think you are asking awesome questions because they are challenging ones to answer. They're not, they're not ones that uh, I think we do a great job of uh, addressing in many cases. And I think um, in, in this case, 
you know, I would love to see a conversation parallel to the one we're having this evening, but w that engaged uh, those other audiences that we're talking about. You know, perhaps around a collection of, you know, a sub collection of work from a particular community, I, I, uh, and, and maybe uh, we could draft some of you, you all to facilitate that kind of conversation. And but I think, um, you know thinking about consciously creating venues, whether it's in online spaces like this or getting people together or, uh, in an evening or, or on, a, on a Saturday with, with pizza, uh, to, uh, to do some of the, the thinking around specific pieces of uh, writing that students have produced and, and the reactions of audiences to those would be a great first step. And I see that Jenna would like to chime in here. Please do. And then we'll turn it back to Darren to do a wrap up for us. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I guess what I have to, have to say is still more of a question reflecting back to the group. And it has to do with the question of I love the idea of community engagement in the assessment process and in talking about literacy and student writing. Um, but I'm also wondering if we've made that conversation public enough yet. Um, for, for those discussions to, um, to be as far reaching and open as, as this one has been here. And so I think Darren set the context for what we would have to do to get to that place. But I think even the way that you all are talking about literacy is so different from what I hear in the mainstream media right now. And so I, I would love to think about ways that we can, we can get that out into the public conversation more. Thank you, Jenna. And so, Darren, would you wrap it up for us, please? Thank you. So I want to thank all of the panelists for their really thoughtful uh, observations on the, on the day of writing as a whole, of their analysis of particular pieces, uh, and particularly, Catherine, for your really uh, thoughtful and provocative questions, which I think generated a really rich discussion this evening. And this is really the first in what we hope will be a, a large number of discussions in the coming months around the theme of assessment and what's next in assessment. Uh, during this month, during Connected Educator Month, we've been trying to uh, do some work thinking about assessment through our New Frontiers in Assessment hot seats, uh, threaded discussions with people doing progressive work, uh, not just in literacy, but a variety of fields uh, in moving beyond standardized assessments to who, uh, more progressive forms that capture a, or a broader perspective on learning and are much more useful to educators uh, in the classroom and to educational leaders. Uh, and this is a theme that, that uh, NCT will be continuing to take up uh, in the coming months, uh, a primary focus for us, uh, thinking about how do we raise the profile of formative assessment, how do we engage uh, broader audiences in understanding different perspectives of, of assessment and participating in them, um, and how do we envision in a uh, next generation of assessment and accountability that is more grounded uh, in the expertise of teachers and of students themselves and of the community and better able to support genuine building of capacity in literacy education. So a uh, big thanks to everyone uh, and to all of you that, that were here live or that are watching this recording for contributing to that conversation, which we hope will bear fruit in the coming years uh, with a real new regime of assessment and in education that uh, will be suited to really e creating the highly literate and uh, pro-literacy communities that all of our students deserve.